Uh, this is Mass of the Ages, uh, and we're here live with Timothy Flanders. Someday Dr. Timothy Flanders, right? Is that what you're working towards? Uh, no, I, I gave up the PhD uh, okay. efforts, so <laughs> not anytime soon. When, I, when, when I'm retired, uh, I'll get the PhD then. Oh, okay. That, that sounds fun. I have a lot of plans for when I'm retired. It's going to be great. <laughs> Uh, we're here talking today about what does the church actually say about communion in the hand. It's a follow-up to our episode, uh, was that last week? Wow, about communion on the tongue with Abby Johnson. And there's just a lot of questions that came up and a lot of things that uh, we would like to go through and kind of read through them with you. And this is a lot more casual than what we did last week, so I, I want to engage more with the chat. So... If you have questions or comments, leave them in the chat wherever you're watching, and uh, we'll just go through this question. So, uh, Timothy, why don't you introduce yourself for anyone who wasn't at the last week's stream? Sure. Uh, my name is Timothy Flanders. I'm a Catholic writer, and I run a lay apostolate, meaningofcatholic.com, and I work especially with Kennedy Hall. We have a weekly morning man show. Check it out on Monday mornings on YouTube, as well as Our Lady of Victory Press. And there's two books coming out soon from Tan, from Kennedy and myself. So that's what's going on with me. Cool. Thanks. So this this topic, uh, what does the church actually say about communion in the hand? It sounds so clinical and like, why does this even matter? Are we just trads who are looking for stuff to argue about? Um so the first question I want to ask just to kick us off is why does this matter to you? Yeah, um, I, I'm glad you mentioned trads because what I want to emphasize in, in what I want to present here is that this is not a dividing issue between so-called trads and so-called conservatives at all. And in fact, I'm going to use Cardinal Sarah, who is, I don't think he would be considered a trad, um, to help help us elucidate this and, and the Pope uh, St. Paul the, the Sixth, um, John Paul II, and Benedict the Sixteenth, they've all made themselves very perfectly clear about this. Um, so it does not need to be some kind of divisive thing where the trads are off doing their thing and the, you know, John Paul II Catholics or New Mass Revised Nova Sordo Catholics or whatever are doing their thing. This does not need to be that way at all. We just need to think with the church, think with the mind of the church. And that's what is necessary here and what, what, what we're going to try to present here, God willing. Um, and so, but to answer your question, um, I'm just going to quote from Cardinal, Cardinal Sura. This is um, his preface to the book that was in Italian. It was um, La Distribuzione della Comunione sulla Mano by Federico Bortoli. And there's translations of this by Diane Montagna over at LifeSite. And he says this. Quote, if Jesus is the substance of the Eucharistic bread, and if the dimensions of the fragments are accidents only of the bread, it is of little importance how big or small a piece of the host is. The substance is the same. It is him. And then he further says, inattention to the fragments makes us lose sight of the dogma. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote Vatican II by saying, the Eucharist is the source and summit of our faith. And so if we have this great gift from God that is the source and summit of our faith, we are going to treat it with the utmost care and reverence, including the, the fragments and the particles of our Lord, who is, his body is broken for us. And in the, the Eucharistic bread is this, the substance of that very essence of his sacrifice, including the way that all of the pieces of our Lord are united into one Christ and unites the church into one body of Christ. So it's, it comes from the heart. It, it's not a pharisaical rigidity or something. It comes from, we just celebrated the Corpus Christi and Sacred Heart of Jesus. And this is just coming from a heart that loves Jesus Christ and wants to unite oneself with Jesus Christ in the most blessed sacrament. And so that's what causes this great concern and this love of the faithful 
and veneration for the particles and concern about this issue. Yeah, this this is the king. <laughs> it is our king. Um, we believe that. I think everyone listening to this believes that the Eucharist is the king. And we we not just honor and respect the king, we adore the king. He's the he's the meaning of our existence. And so, you know, going to adoration is lovely. You know, you're adoring the Blessed Sacrament. But then um, I, I would go to Novus Ordo Mass and they wouldn't be using patents. So you're distributing communion and some people are just grabbing it and going. It's, it's like a, you know, uh, it's almost like a, a drive through kind of experience. I don't say that to demean any, you know, priests who are reverent. It's just my experience of it. And uh, when I found out how often um, priests, or sorry, the Eucharist is stolen in situations like that, desecrated, uh, dropped, uh, fragments falling to the ground, getting vacuumed up, us, you know, uh, walking upon the body of our Lord. It just seemed like the, I could not think of a greater disparity of like, we do thing, thing A on Wednesday, which is adore the Lord, and we do thing B on Sunday, which is we don't, really care about his his presence or his body so yeah this for me it's the eucharist is everything to me and so um, i think it's important for us to uh, learn what the church actually says about communion in the hand and then how we can be faithful catholics in uh, giving proper reverence to god in the blessed sacrament um last summer <clears throat> this is about the time the pew study came out so Anyone who doesn't know, Pew study says that seventy percent of so-called Catholics don't believe in the real presence, and of regular mass-going Catholics, so weekly mass-going Catholics, only sixty percent of them believe, uh, which is just wild to me. I decided to, for some reason, pick up the Book of Maccabees because it there was there was like one line in it that uh, had something to do with like their love for sacred things. And uh, it's it's a fascinating read if you've never read the book, uh, books of Maccabees one and two. Um, but this this is a good illustration of the kind of zeal I think we should have for God's law and sacred objects. But we're saying so much more than that. It's not just something God says or an object that reminds us or relates to God, it is God. And so, you know, uh, I, I'm not a biblical scholar, but in the book of Maccabees, so this is before, I believe, the exile, and uh, King Antiochus is uh, fighting. He comes into and besieges Israel. Uh, just listen to, to what happens. So Israel, they have the temple, the Holy of Holies, which again is is what it's the place that God overshadowed with his presence. Not even not even to talk about God himself, but just okay, the, the Holy of Holies is the place that God's presence is. So King Antiochus comes into Israel with a strong force, and I quote from uh, 1 Maccabees 1, verse 21. He arrogantly entered the sanctuary and took the golden altar, the lampstand for the light, and all its utensils. He took also the table for the bread of the presence, the cups for drink offerings, the bowls, the golden censers, the curtain, the crowns, and the gold decoration on the front of the temple, and he stripped it all off. And then, so this is a little later in verse 41, so he, he like, you know, besieges the temple, takes all this all the sacred objects and he's like distributing them he's taking a lot of it for himself you know gold he just keeps it and then he's like selling or like giving it to people so the sacred objects became profane they were just like used casually throughout the land and then king antiochus wrote to his whole kingdom so including israel that all should be one people and that each should give up his customs and all the Gentiles accepted the command of the king, 
Many even from Israel gladly adopted his religion, and they profaned the Sabbath. But the point of the book of Maccabees is there were some, and this is verse 63, who chose to die rather than to be defiled by food or to profane the holy covenant, and they did die. So I, I bring that up just to say, like, we, <laughs> when we read, I, when I read the book of Maccabees, I was like, wow, I want to have that zeal for the Lord's house. Not that I'm consumed in bitterness, but I'm consumed in love for what is, what is due to God. And we're not talking here about things related to God. We're talking about God himself. And so that's why this topic is of critical importance. What does the church actually say about communion in the hand and communion on the tongue? So here we go. Let's, uh, let's get into the history about communion on the hand, communion on the tongue. Um, and then uh, we can go from there. How's that sound? Where do you yeah. want to start? Yeah. Um, so first of all, it should be understood that there was an ancient practice of communion in the hand. And this is something that's important to note because when the practice is reintroduced, it's going to be different. And this is the key. I'm going to quote from the document Memorale Domini, uh, which is 1969. And this is when the, and we'll talk about this in, when we get into the modern times and what this document is, but this document is making historical judgments as well. And what we'll see is this, this document from the Holy See under Paul VI makes a judgment about the history, and it makes the judgment that communion on the tongue is objectively better for the Roman rite. And this is what it says about this ancient custom. So there was an ancient custom of communion in the hand, and it, the, but the document says this. However, the church's prescriptions of the writings of the fathers make it abundantly clear that the maximum reverence and the greatest prudence were shown toward the sacred Eucharist received. Thus, quoting from the fathers, this is from uh, Augustine, Cyril, and Hippolytus, let nobody eat that flesh without first adoring it. And in taking it, people were warned, receive it, be careful lest you lose any of it, for it is the body of Christ. And St. Cyril of Jerusalem says that if you were to lose any part of the sacred mysteries, you, one should understand it as if one of your limbs were amputated. And so, as this document says, it's the maximum reverence possible for this, for the, the Blessed Sacrament. And so, what happened? Well, the document goes on and says this. With the passing of time, the truth of the Eucharistic mystery, of its power, and of the presence of Christ in it were being more deeply studied due to an ever-urgent sense of the reverence due to the Blessed Sacrament of the humility necessary to order to receive it. The custom was established the minister himself placing a particle of the consecrated bread on the tongue of the communicant. So, the Holy See itself, so this is not some trad blog that I'm reading from. This is a document promulgated by Paul VI. And it's saying that there was an ancient custom, but it was eventually abandoned because it, the presence, the dogma was being more deeply studied. And there was an ever urgent sense of the reverence due to the Blessed Sacrament. So what is interesting is that the ancient custom of communion on the hand was changed into a communion on the tongue. So in the Roman rite, they give the host, as you know, on the tongue. The Byzantine rite has a spoon where they put the, the, uh, the host and the precious blood in one chalice, and then they spoon it onto the communicant's tongue while there's a, there's a cloth patent under that. And then in the Coptic rite, there's also two different chalices where they also use a, a spoon. Now, there's one other church, the, the Church of the Far East, sometimes called the Assyrian Church, sometimes called the, the, the Chaldean Catholic Church. And they actually retained the communion on the hand. I'm going to read from a historical record in uh, 18, what was it? The, oh, 15, let's see. So this is from a witness in 1890 who looks at this. And they, 
they are reviewing the uh, practices of this uh, ancient church. And uh, let me find it. Okay. So this is in 1890. This is a visitor to the ancient Syriac church. It says each communicant incenses his hands. So they're coming up to the communion and he's watching them. So they go up and incense their hands, their face, and their breasts with the incense. And upon him arriving before the priest, they remain on foot, kiss the priest's hand, and present their right palm extended and crossed over the left hand. The priest places there a particle of the host, with the communicate, which the communicate immediately consumes by licking his palm, which he then passes over his forehead to wipe it. And so there's a veneration that is the same. There's, there's a veneration of the particles. So even if there is a use of the hand, the hand basically functions. This is Kwasniewski. Peter Kwasniewski observes that even in the ancient custom, there was the, the hand functioned as a patent, basically. Mm -hmm to then one would lick one's patent. One would not take one's left hand and commune oneself because that would be of an abomination to the fathers because your left hand in the ancient mm -hmm. world is a, a, a sign of disrespect, shall we say. And so what we see in all these different customs that I've just discussed, there is a veneration for the particles. That is the, the main key is there, there's, the smallest fragment of our blessed Lord is venerated and worshiped as our blessed Lord. Now, fast forward to the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant revolt was revolting against the dogma of the real presence. So Martin Bucer, the uh, Anglican, who he mocks. Never heard of that guy. <laughs> Martin <laughs> sounds like Martin Luther's uncle or something. Yeah, there was a few, a few uh, Martins. So he, he mocks this as a superstition to take, take the communion in the tongue. Mm. And it's also clericalism to them. And so they intentionally introduced a form of communion in the hand in order to represent their denial of the real presence of Christ. And so this is something that was introduced by the Protestants. Now, but what we, what we note here is that the Protestant communion in the hand is not at all the same as the ancient Catholic custom. And the difference is that they do not venerate the particles. And so they just commune themselves like it's common bread because to them it is. And in fact, it is actually common bread because they don't have the real presence. So this is the key point here is that, so since that time, the Protestant churches have been communing on the hand with their, their communion, which is not real, as an expression of their denial, their heresy, basically. Um, and lamentably the, their, their loss of the real presence of Christ. And so we need to make a very strong distinction between an ancient custom, which was abandoned, and the Holy See says with good reason, it was abandoned with good reason, and this, this introduction by the, by the heretics to try to confirm their own heresy. So when we get to the 20th century, the introduction of communion on the hand was not a restoration of this ancient custom hmm. for many reasons. First of all, on a, on a bare historical level, what we have are various snapshots, which these different, we have these different sources that mention communion of the hand in various ways. But as I just read, you have to actually be present to witness all the different customs that are going on. Because there's all these different customs which may be entirely orally passed down. And this is gonna this point. would have happened in all these different places, and they're gonna have all sorts of different customs and bowing rituals and various things to venerate the blessed sacrament in whatever way they do. So you can't just go back into history, you can't go back in the time machine and just pick something out by reading the document. You're not gonna get the whole full picture. It can't just be restored out of nothing because we there's not a continuous tradition of passing it down. So we don't have all the different customs that would have been done because many of them would have been oral traditions. So there's a problem, even if you did want to restore an ancient custom, really restore it, you'd already have a historical problem to try to make that up. And furthermore, Pius XII in Mediator Dei he says that there is, uh, this is before this was beginning to take place. 
He says there is such a thing as a senseless and exaggerated antiquarianism. Uh, this is paragraph 64, which is where you want, you see something in the ancient customs and you like it, but what you want to do, you don't want to restore everything. You just want to take one piece of it and bring it to the modern world because it ends up informing your ancient custom. This is what, this is what the Protestants did themselves. The Protestants said that they were restoring an ancient custom. Yeah. Which, which, uh, paragraph is that again? Oh, so that's paragraph 64 in Viator Day. So he's talking about an antiquarianism. So he says, he says this in, in the preceding paragraph 63, he says, it is unwise and mistaken is the zeal of those who in matters liturgical would go back to the rites and usages of antiquity, discarding the new patterns introduced by dis the disposition of divine providence to meet the changes of circumstances and situation. Yeah, l let me underscore this because I think this is, I see this all the time, and I think it's it's one of the excuses, or a, a more charitable word would say reasons people would give for communion on the hand is because it's so ancient. But to disregard centuries of piety in related to worship or custom is to be un-Catholic. I mean, this is this is exactly what. Martin Luther and the reformers wanted to do was let's remove all the medieval, you know, accretions and additions in the mass. And let's go back to the primitive, simple last supper. And I mean, with communion on the tongue, we're talking about whether it was a sixth century, the seventh century, the eighth century, when it became the norm, we're talking about, 1300 years of tradition capital t tradition because this is so time honored and reaffirmed and reaffirmed uh, by the church again and again that it becomes a part of who we are this is catholic um it's not just older is always better it's what has remained what has stood the test of time that's what's important to the yeah. catholic church and so and exactly what you're saying you're just you're just repeating what the Holy See said in 1969. This method of distributing Holy Communion on the tongue must be retained, taking the present situation of the church in the, into account, not merely because it is a practice rooted in many years, century of tradition, but especially because it expresses reverence of the Christian faithful for the Eucharist. Hmm. Um, there is There is such a thing as restoring ancient traditions, like, for example, like what St. Teresa did with the Carmelites of her day. She was restoring an ancient rigor. But typically, when you're restoring something of, of ancient uh, antiquity, you're actually making things more rigorous. You're saying, we've become <laughs> lax, so we're going back to what St. Francis Assisi said in the beginning. We're going to go back to that, get more rigorous. That's typically what these you know real reformers will do, is that like, we've got lax, let's get back to the rigor. Um, and, and exactly what you're saying there are other other sort of faux restorations like this antiquarianism. Just because something is ancient, that does not necessarily mean it should be restored. And to give it another example, the early church had, you know, if you committed adultery, you had to do penance for seven years, something like that. You know, to you had no communion for seven years. You had to weep outside the church and do, you know, sackcloth and ashes and all this. You know, are they saying they want to restore that as well? No, they don't want to do that. They just want to pick something. And this is this is what was condemned by the Holy See. The Holy See condemned this practice because what happened was in various Protestant rich countries. So we're talking France, Germany, Belgium, Holland. In the 19th, early 1960s, with, under, with, during the Second Vatican Council, especially up to 1965, there was what Paul VI himself said was an, an abuse, an abuse yeah, right. of the liturgy. He called it an abuse. This is Paul VI. Again, not a rad trad blog, blog we're, we're quoting from here. This so, is how communion in the hand began. So communion in the hand in, began. And this is, let me just again quote from Sarah. So he says this. So he, um, so he says, this is again from that preface to the book, which I'll mention more as we go through this history. He says this, 
quote, the Lord leads the just along straight paths, not by subterfuge. Therefore, the way in which the practice of communion in the hand has spread appears to have been imposed not according to the ways of God. And here's um, the conclusion of this study, and I, I encourage especially any priest or cleric watching this to pick up this book from PCP Books um, by uh, Bishop Juan Rodolfo Raise, rest in peace. It's called Holy Communion, and in it, he documents all these things that we're going to we're trying to uh, bring out. And he said, he concludes this from all this and all of his study that, that we'll discuss in a minute. He says, we believe it right to affirm that the introduction and diffusion throughout the world of the practice of communion in the hand constitutes the most serious disobedience to the papal authority of recent times. Well, how, how could he possibly say this? Well, here's what happened. So as, as we said, this was an abuse where in Protestant countries, so they already, the Protestant countries already had their heretical version of communion in the hand, hmm. which the key difference is that there was no veneration of the particles. So in these Protestant dominant countries, the Catholics started to take communion on the hand in the Protestant way, not as a means of restoring these ancient customs with all these extra rituals and customs and licking yeah. your hand and bowing, none of that stuff. They probably didn't have St. Cyril in mind. They weren't quoting Cyril and like, how can we restore this ancient practice? They, it was an act of disobedience. Yes, it was an act of disobedience to get along with the Protestants. And that, that essentially was what was happening. And the problem the Holy See was having so first of all, the Holy See in 1965 was sending letters to these places, stop this practice, letters to the bishop, stop this practice. They continued to rebel. Then we have the Dutch Catechism. <clears throat> the Dutch Catechism comes out, and I think it's 67, if I recall. But um, the Dutch Catechism comes out, and it's this is by their these bishops. And that catechism says that the particles are not the real presence. It, it, for, first of all, it says this. It says, quote, through his Holy Spirit in the hearts and the mutual relationships of men, the presence of Christ in the Holy Spirit in the hearts and mutual relationships of men is the greatest form of his presence. Hmm. And the particles are not the real presence. <laughs> so this is what the Dutch catechism says. So then we have a reaction from the Holy See, 1968, when Paul VI, he so he first puts out the credo of the people of God, and that is an orthodox creed, which is against the Dutch catechism. And then you have Humanae Vitae the same year. And then later that same year in the fall, there are, it's just a, there's just a worldwide rebellion of priests and bishops against the Pope. And this is happening everywhere, most notably the Windsor Statement uh, in Canada at this time, which is going against the um against uh humanae vitae hmm. wait is it the windsor statement i don't recall actually i could be oh winnipeg i'm sorry not windsor winnipeg confuse my canadian cities sorry canadians um <laughs> so the winnipeg statement is so this is this is massive rebellion so the 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 holy see is saying okay what are we supposed to do here we've got this massive rebellion there's abuses everywhere and in May of 1969, it's when Memorale Domini is promulgated. Now, the, the Holy See actually sent out a questionnaire, which you quoted on our last show, to try, it, it actually consulted the bishops, what do we do with this abuse? And actually said, should we allow this communion in the hand? And the majority of bishops across the world said, no, we do not, we are not in favor of introducing communion in the hand. So in 1969, Memorale Domini, it said, some of the quotations that I said, it said that the uh, communion, on the, communion on the tongue should be maintained for all these reasons. It further says, this practice, communion on the tongue, must be considered traditional, ensures more effectively that the holy communion is distributed with all due respect, decorum, and dignity, so that the danger of profanation in the Eucharistic species is prevented. Um, and so the we have the judgment of the Holy See right here, 1969. This is a more effective means of reverencing the Eucharist. 
says the Holy See. So we're not we're not being again Brad Trad blog here. We're just repeating the words of Pope Paul VI to say that this is actually more effective, and this is what should be the norm. And so the Holy See confirms this as the norm and says that it should be maintained. And the only issue is that the decision is made to allow an indult because of the massive rebellion. Paul VI mentions a mentality of rebellion. So what do you do with disobedient children when they're all rebelling against you? Do you come with a whip or do you come with sweet words? How do you win them over is the question. Now, what Paul VI did was clearly a, an attempt to limit communion on the hand. It Lamentably, it was completely ineffective. It, mm -hmm. it, it The opposite happened. And so the indult, an indult means an exception to a universal law, hmm. an indult. That's the key, is that it's an exception to a universal law. And the reason there is a, an exception is because it's trying to prevent a greater evil. So the Holy See considered wide-scale rebellion of priests and bishops to be a greater evil than the actual abuse that was happening with the communion in the hand. So thus, they allowed an indult for those places where it could not, the abuse could not be rooted out. We're just going to allow these disobedient children to be disobedient for a time and try to discourage it and limit it and stop it through different means than coming down with the hammer. So that was, this is all documented in, in these, in these texts that, that I read from Memorale Domini. And then further, the uh, 1972, the Holy Office officially clarifies that the particles retain the real presence. So there's further clarification against this Dutch catechism. And further says 1973, immense caritatis. We must have the immense concern and caution if it is, if communion in the hand is allowed especially about particles that might fall from the hosts. However, so we have all these official statements, which is making very clear, but the problem was that there were bishops and priests, including those in the Vatican, who were against the mind of the Holy Father. Hmm. And they were trying to overturn this, even as his mind had been very clearly expressed. And so this is why uh, Laise says that this is disobedience to the, the papal mandate. So um, the infamous Annabale Bunini started to promote the falsity that communion in the hand has, quote, an equal standing in the history of the church. And equal can standing. That's an interesting turn of phrase. Right. So this is quoting from Bunini's article in 1973, which is quoted in his book, Liturgy, uh, Reformed Liturgy, page 660. And so he's, he's saying that this was actually... Um, this has equal standing. It's it's helpful today to re restore this, this uh, you know this practice. Um, but basically, episcopal conferences, whole episcopal conferences were were promoting this as if the Holy See wanted it, but in fact it was the opposite, because there were so many different. And this is what happens during this period in the 1960s and 70s, and even today. There's so much lost in communication because people are able to manipulate, people who have an agenda are able to manipulate things. And the prefect of the Congregation of the Doctrine of Worship, or the uh, prefect of worship, Cardinal Knox, he granted every single indult that was requested of him. And so this practice continued to spread hmm. and, until Paul VI in 1977. He finds that this has been has been a disaster and he attempts to suspend all indults hmm. at the request of Cardinal Baffile, who had studied it and found that there was all these abuses. It was just doing the opposite. So they were trying to suspend all the indults in February of 1978. Cardinal Knox refuses to suspend all indults. 
And this was finally um, John Paul II. So we have the great St. John Paul II comes to the throne of St. Peter in 1978. Now in uh, February, so we have this attempt to stop the indults. The, the bureaucracy of the Vatican refuses to obey the Pope. He dies, John Paul I. Then he dies, John Paul II gets on the throne in 1978. So then he comes out two years later, 1980, in uh, Dominice Cene. He says... Um, He's referring to communion in the hand. He says, this practice has been requested by individual Episcopal conferences, have been received approval of the Apostolic See. And he says this, however, cases of a deplorable lack of respect toward the Eucharistic species have been reported. Cases which are imputable not only to the individuals guilty of such behavior, but also the pastors of the church who have not been vigilant enough regarding the attitude of the faithful toward the Eucharist. And, and then also... Can, wait, can you read that again? Yes. That... I mean, that's that's strong language coming from JP2, so I want to... So JP2 says this. He says, cases of a deplor... So re regarding communion in the hand, cases of a deplorable lack of respect towards the Eucharistic species have been reported. Cases which are imputable not only to the individuals guilty of such behavior, but also to the pastors of the church who have not been vigilant enough regarding the attitude of the faithful toward the Eucharist. And even, and this is a key point for what we're going to talk about, even it also happens on occasion that the free choice of those who prefer to continue the practice of receiving Eucharist on the tongue is not taken into account. And so in 1980, John Paul II suspended the indults finally. So he was able to suspend the indults. Now, lamentably, it was resumed. And there's lots of history here, which I, I, haven't been able to study all the workings of the Vatican bureaucracy, but what seems clear, especially from the conduct of Cardinal Knox, is that there were many, and Bunini, there were many in the Vatican across the world who were trying to promote the Protestant communion in the hand version against the Holy See. And it's clear that even in the document I, I mentioned before, even if the Holy See allowed the communion in, in the hand, it had in mind an actual restoration of the ancient custom by venerating the particles. And so this is the key difference between this. Now, the right of the faithful to receive on the tongue is a key point, which John Paul II mentions here. He confirms it. It was confirmed by the Holy See on multiple occasions. The, um, so in, in a letter 1985, is uh, April 3rd, 1985, to the National Conference of Catholic Bishops, later named the USCCB, says this, the faithful, quote, the faithful are not to be obliged to adopt the practice of communion in the hand. Each one is free to communicate in one way or the other in the cases where it was allowed. So we have the universal norm, communion in the tongue, but even if it is allowed to put it in the hand, the faithful still have the right to choose the universal norm. Because that's clearly what the church wants. They want everyone to commune on the tongue. If we're going to allow this abuse because of an indult, fine. But the pastors must take vigilance to care for the particles. And the faithful always have the right to receive on the tongue. And this was confirmed again in 1999. Whether the diocese were allowed, this is a question, in uh, to the CD, at CDW, the Congregation for Divine Worship. It says this, whether the, the question is whether in diocese where it is allowed to distribute in the hand, um, the holy, the, the communion may restrict communicants to receive only on their hands, not on the tongue. So can they, re, can they be restricted from receiving on the tongue? Here's the response, the official response from the CDW. Certainly it is clear from the very documents of the Holy See that in dioceses where the Eucharistic bread is put in the hand of the faithful, the right to receive the communion bread on the tongue still remains intact to the faithful. Therefore, those who restrict communicants to receive commun Holy Communion only on the hands are acting against the norms, as are those who refuse to Christ's faithful the right to receive human in the tongue if they've given them the indult. So he, the, basically the standard is you have to follow the law. You have to follow the universal law, and the universal law is always in place. And if there's an exception to it, then that's permitted. 
but they always have this right. So this is this is confirmed once again and again and again. Uh, another key document is um, the General Instruction for Roman Missile 2002, uh, which uh, continues to confirm that communion of the tongue is the norm. Um, the then there's 2004 Redemptione Sacramentum, another instruction on communion, which once again confirms the exact same thing. This is paragraph 91. It is not licit to deny Holy Communion to any of Christ's faithful solely on the grounds, for example, that the pre person wishes to receive the Eucharist kneeling or standing. Each of the faithful always has the right to receive Holy Communion on the tongue as at his choice. But it says further this, if there is a risk of profanation, then Holy Communion should not be given to the, in the hand to the faithful. Yeah, I have that ready to go. It's shared right now. I think that's right. so important because people hear communion on the hand and they hear it's been granted an indult, so there's a permission, there's an exception to the rule, and they have a particular image of communion on the hand. It looks like, you know, what they're doing at my parish is okay because we do communion on the hand and there's permission for that. But... Again and again, the church underscores the fact that, read this line, if there is a risk of profanation, then Holy Communion should not be given in the hand to the faithful. The communion plate for the communion of the faithful should be retained so as to avoid the danger of the sacred host or some fragment of it falling. So it's not just communion in the hand is allowed, it's if this, if that, only in this circumstance, it's very limited. And that seems to be, to me, to be the most striking thing. If there's a risk of profanation, that means like uh, through some even accident, you know, like a, a particle falls to the ground. And uh, if there's a risk of profanation, Holy Communion should not be given to the hand of the faithful. That is so, I think that's so important for me. And for people to know that is what the church says about communion in the hand it's it's it has all these restrictive clauses yes very important there as john paul ii said in 1980 there is a duty of the priest to restrict communion in the hand if there's profanation and if we're talking about the particles as we've said there is that danger as you said in the last broadcast regarding a scientific study which proved that there is a loss of particles in every communion in the hand so there needs to be an actual, if, if a priest is in a diocese, according to all these authoritative sources we're, we're reading from here, from the Holy See itself, from the Pope, and from the official congregations, this must be, if, if there is an indult in place and the priest must give communion in the hand in the new mass, then he must, he must instruct his faithful to receive and venerate all particles and consume all particles. In Ecclesia de Eucharistia, 2003, John Paul II says this, paragraph 61, there can be no danger of excess in our care for this mystery. Mm -hmm. That's another key point because people get accused of being too extreme. Well, John Paul II says there are no extremes. There could be no danger of excess. He says, go to the extreme on this. And so finally in 2008, Corpus Christi, Benedict XVI, he reintroduces on at the papal liturgy exclusive communion on the tongue and kneeling. And so once again, we have Paul the sixth, John Paul II, and finally Benedict the sixteenth, all confirming the same teaching of the church mm -hmm. that's been for generations and generations and centuries. And then further, we finally get to 2009 during the swine flu pandemic. And once again, Another dubium was sent to the Congregation of the Divine Worship, which said, is there this right? Does this still maintain this right even during this pandemic, the swine flu? And the, they said, yes, the right still maintains, still is there, quoting uh, what we just quoted from um, Redemptionis Sacramentum. So this is a very important precedent. So 2009, they confirmed that even during a pandemic, the right of the faithful to receive on the tongue is still is still there. Now, I want to emphasize this is really the rights of 
Jesus Christ. This hmm. is really what this is about. It is, it's the rights of Jesus Christ to be worshipped and properly received. It's not ultimately about the right of the faithful. It's about the right of Jesus Christ to be worshipped and adored as is fitting. Hmm. And so we need to be concerned when we consider divine worship, we need to be concerned first and foremost about the glory and honor given to Almighty God. That's the that's the end all be all of divine right. worship. And so it's ultimately the right of Jesus Christ to be received on the tongue so that none of his particles that he has shed his blood for us and he has died and his body has been broken. And so the particles of his body may not be scattered that's right. as common bread, but may be worshiped as is his right. It is his right to receive worship. Mm -hmm. And so that is, that's the key. And that's, that's coming from, once again, a heart that adores Jesus Christ and loves him. So, so finally, we get to our current controversy. So I wanted to read all this to provide the context for the situation we're in now, because anyone who is just read these documents with, with an open heart, one can see that the mind of the church is absolutely clear. Communion in the tongue is objectively better and it should be maintained and promoted and communion in the hand should not and can only be permitted after it was introduced as, a, as an abuse by indult to avoid some greater evil. So, yeah. So before you, before you go on, I, I want to say to say it is objectively better is true because it's time honored. It's been reaffirmed by the church time and time again. Uh, you just quoted uh, Pope after Pope after Pope. There's also like this subjective component, which I think a lot of people get hung up on and they, they want to say, well, are you saying you're better than me or whatever? Like just because you receive on the tongue, are you automatically a better Catholic? And that's not what we're saying. So um, what we're not saying is ipso facto, you receive on the hand, you're a bad Catholic or you're less holy than me or not as reverent or this and that. But, but what we want to say is, have you ever considered these things? Have you ever considered that the church has reaffirmed this again and again? Have you ever considered that particles are lost, not may, may be lost, but are consistently lost? Have you considered those things? Have you considered that this is, that when a child walks into a Catholic church or a Muslim or an atheist, and they see people kneeling and receiving on the tongue that they recognize that this isn't just blessed bread or a communion service. This is, they believe something radical about that host. Have you considered the objective uh, standard, the what it objectively looks like? Um, so I just want to lay all that out to just say like, it is objectively better, but we're, we're just talking about objective facts and about what the church has said time and time again. So, I think um, Buck Cooper brought up that quote. I think the quote is from John Paul II. I think it's from Dominici Cheney. Yes. Um, if I recall. So, yeah, he's making reference here to the fact that many commune on the hand with great reverence and, and holiness. And so that's, that's a very important point because people, you know, are can be offended by that. We don't want to offend anyone, any of our brethren who are communing on the, on the hand and they don't realize it or, or they've just been grown up their way and they have a great childlike faith of the real presence and they always have. And that is far more worthy uh, because ultimately God is worshipped by the humble heart. And so if, if you have a perfect Latin mass with all the bells and whistles and everything, but you are offering it with a proud heart, that is a stench in the Lord's nostrils. And so that's I, Isaiah chapter one. He says this. And so it's very important that we understand that and we don't get stuck into the externals as if the externals were what God really desires. He really desires the heart. And so the externals are simply there for the sake of that heart. And so that's a very, very important point to, to bring up. Um, now, I'm going to get to Cardinal Sarah now, uh, looking at the the, the uh, controversy. Now, the uh, book by uh, Juan Rodolfo Leise, 
uh, was followed up by the, the book that I mentioned at the beginning, the Italian book. It's in Italian. The preface was written by Cardinal Serra. And he says this, and he makes mention of St. John Paul II, and he also makes mention of St. Teresa of Calcutta in his preface, where he calls this book um, the defense of Paul VI, John Paul II, and Benedict XVI. He says that it is a beautiful defense of the position of these popes. Hmm. So once again, this is Federico Bertoli, La Descripzione della Comunione Sulemano, 2018, which underscores these things that we're we're discussing and how this whole this abuse was it was uh, imposed and and introduced by subterfuge. So Cardinal Sara says this, and this is going to provide context for the current controversy that we have now. He says this quote. St. Teresa of Calcutta was saddened and pained when she saw Christians receiving Holy Communion in their hands. In addition, she said that as far as she knew, all of her sisters received communion only on the tongue. And Cardinal Sarra says this, Why do we insist on receiving communion standing and on the hand? Why this attitude of lack of submission to the signs of God? May no priest dare to impose his authority in this matter by refusing or mistreating those who wish to receive communion kneeling and on the tongue. Let us come as children and humbly receive the body of Christ on our knees and on the, our tongue. The saints give us the example. They are the models to be imitated that God offers us. So we have the prefect of the Congregation of Divine Worship, Cardinal Sarah, confirming once again in this preface that no priest may dare to impose communion on the hand. So this is the key point. Now, now the coronavirus pandemic begins this past year, and Cardinal Serra gives an interview to the Daily Compass, May 2nd, 2020. Ricardo Caschioli, the article's called Serra, profanities have to stop, the Eucharist isn't negotiable. And he, the interviewer brings up the, the question that had already arisen at that time in May of 2020, where individual bishops or priests were beginning to impose communion on the hand. And he said, that they bring, brought this to Cardinal Sarah, and he said, no, he says this, quote, there is already a rule in the church and this must be respected. The faithful are free to receive communion in the mouth or hand. So once again, confirming what he said in 2018 in print, May no priest dare. Now, in August of 2020, he recently releases a circular letter which says that in times of difficulty, wars and pandemics, bishops and Episcopal conferences can give provisional norms, which must be obeyed. And he urged obedience, obedience to safeguards and treasures entrusted to the church. So he's so he's saying that we must obey the provisional uh, norms given by the bishops. Now, he does not mention communion on the hand. Based on his past statements that I've read, one would assume that the bishops would have the right to impose whatever norms they wish to impose according to the law. So they would have to be according to the universal law of the church, which is already in place, which has been confirmed over and over by multiple popes and congregations, even during an, a previous pandemic. So one would assume at that point that there is no exception to the rule. So whatever provisional norms we must obey would then have to be inside that rule. We might, we're not going to say that the bishops have some right to change the words of the mass or something like that. That's not allowed. You can't change the words of the mass. It, it has to be read out. You can't, you also can't read it from memory. You can't just pray it from memory. These are not, these are things that are not allowed. So if, if a bishop were to say, well, all my priests don't have to say the whole mass because we're just trying to get everybody communed during this pandemic. Hmm. That would be against the universal law so that we can assume that these provisional norms are simply whatever provisional norms, you know, if it if it does mean closing a church here or there or trying to do whatever you need within the norms of the law, we can assume that's what he what he meant in terms of August 2020. Now, however, a controversy arose because a certain bishop of the United States did end up imposing communion on the hand. This was then challenged, according to everything we just talked about. And it was sent then to the Congregation of the Divine Worship. And there was a response given by the Undersecretary 
it was not by Colonel Sura, but sometimes the answers are given by secretaries and lower uh, um, officials in the congregation. And so that actually confirmed the efforts of this particular bishop to impose communion in the hand only. So this would this opens up a break with all of the recent tradition, the recent law and recent norms of all the previous popes. And even, it would seem, the current head of the Congregation of Divine Worship. Now recall, now we don't know exactly what happened here because it doesn't make any sense, on, at least on prima facie, it doesn't make sense because as we said, this has been confirmed over and over, even Cardinal Sura makes it clear in, in these different quotations that we've read. So it's, it's quite strange and that this norm is now presumably changed. So this introduces a bunch of questions. So are they changing the universal norm? Are they revoking all the rights that have been confirmed again and again on, on, on the authority of the secretary? Uh, was Cardinal Sarah consulted? We assume he was, but then that would contradict what he said just previously and what has been confirmed again as law. So it introduces further questions. Now, as you mentioned, however, even if one bishop in one diocese in the entire world was able to confirm this, that may or may not mean that your diocese is affected. 2,898 uh, dioceses would not be affected. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> I googled the number, so go ahead. What, what uh, Bishop Juan Rodolfo Luise brings out is that so in 1996, Argentina had never allowed communion on the hand uh, until 1996. And that was when their Episcopal Conference introduced it. And then Bishop Laise said, no, I, I have no reason to allow this in my diocese. No one has ever done this in my diocese. No one's doing it now. There's no reason to allow it. I don't allow it. And then he was, he was accused of being a you know, disobedient, schismatic, or whatever. And then he looked into it, and this is what he, why he wrote this book, and he, he found that there is no reason to, uh, for any bishop to allow this. It's, it's to, uh, completely up to the bishop to allow it in his diocese or not. Even if there's a universal indult allowed to a, an Episcopal conference, and this is from so let me give you another quote here from, this is from Pro Professor Mauro Gal Gagliardi, who is the former consultant of the Office of Liturgical Celebrations of the Supreme Pontiff Benedict XVI. And this is in the journal, the Department of Philosophy and Theology of Regina Apostolorum Pontifical University. And he says this in an article entitled, The Legislative Authority of the Diocesan Bishop. He says this, quote, if a bishop decides not to apply the indult in his diocese, it would not be he who prohibits the distribution of Holy Communion in the hand, but the general norm confirmed by the Supreme Authority, Paul VI, through Memorale Domini. And this was in the year 2013. So it is completely up to an individual bishop. It is within his own authority whether or not he wants to permit the indult or not. So the lesson is viewers we need to write our bishops write them a letter you can inform many bishops may not even be aware of this type of thing and, and bishop louis laise was not and he looked into it and that's what he found and so and, and as we confirm here from maro gagliardi every bishop has the right to do it or not and so this is a great subject to write your bishop a letter and make reference to this book you can you could buy this book and send it to your bishop and we're not we're not getting any royalties from PCP books, by the oh, way. Man. But uh, buy them this book, send it to your bishop, write a little note. We're praying for you every night in our family rosary, Bishop. Send them the book, um, and or you know talk to your talk to your priest, talk to your priest that you know. Priests may not be aware of this either. It's very important that we become aware of this so that nothing happens like happened in this particular diocese, and may be confirmed by some Vatican official. And we we as the faithful need to 
lamentably, we need to fight to defend the rights of Jesus Christ in the Holy Sacrament at times. And so I encourage all viewers to write to your bishop, write to your priest, share with them this information. That's why I tried in this whole broadcast, I tried to give all the references and all the notes and everything right here. So it's all laid out for anybody to see, share this video. Um, so all those those words that are just the all the official pronouncements are very clear. Yeah, and we'll include um, the links to everything we talked about. Give me like a day to write it up. Um, and then there's also, a, we, we've gotten some comments about what about the council of this or the council of that, which, you know, condemned communion in the hand and all that. I'll just, we'll post that in the comments. So if you're watching this a few days later, you can read up more, sorry, in the description. You can read in the description. Um, now Jody says, how would you answer a good priest who asked me if I believe in the church's authority to change the practice? So this gets kind of to the, the crux, which is, Every it, that that whole thing on like this bishop and then Cardinal Seurat and like back, the back and forth. I'm I still don't clearly understand what the right thing, the bit the um, jurisdiction of the bishop in that diocese. Like how much authority does he have to change the norm? Uh, so maybe you could you could speak specifically to that. But then I would say to Jody like this is, it's already been enunciated by the church that in the other uh, the the uh what number that 2898 dioceses the, the rest of the dioceses that the norm is uh communion on the tongue so um so about that specific diocese let's say a bishop says in my diocese you can only receive communion on the hand um it sounds like he might have that authority um to do that in his diocese, it might is that yeah. Is that just gave you, you, yeah. If you want to put that in the chat, I've got. Um, so this is the canonist at canonlawmadeeasy.com, and there's uh, resources for just the. I mean, basically, this is this has been a problem for decades on all sorts of different problems, um, but I mean, how do you answer that? Uh, yes, in theory, the church can govern certain disciplines which are not regarding the es essence of the sacrament. The church can't change the Eucharist from wheat bread into uh, rice bread or something like that. That's impossible. Church doesn't have authority to do that. But the church does have, have authority to change certain disciplines in, in the manner in which that is done. So yes, the church does have authority, but did you know, Father Monsignor, that the church actually did not changed the practice. The church confirmed the traditional practice in Memorale Domini and called Paul VI, called the change an abuse. So it's not me disbelieving in the church. It's Paul VI saying this is an abuse which needs to be stopped. So we don't need to, again, this is, to me, this is the key point, is that we don't need to go to the Rad Trad blog to give us our authority here. This is just the voice of the church, the voice of various popes uh, saying these things. That's right. Uh, what people might not know about Memorale Domini, so this is after Paul VI petitioned the bishops to vote on should the norm be changed to communion on the hand because there was all these, there were several countries uh, or a few countries who were implementing it in disobedience as a sacrilege. It, it was not a good it was thing. Not, it was not should the norm be changed, it should, should we allow this? Just right, yep. Should we provide an indult? Yes. Is that how you'd say it? Okay. Um, so it, the indult was allowed, but there was, it was only for where it was already normalized. So um, in places where it, <laughs> there was already like, uh, it's kind of ambiguous, but it sounds like where it was already the majority practice to receive communion on the hand. And that the majority, a two-thirds majority of bishops needed to vote on it to allow the indult, and it needed to be approved by the Holy See. So it wasn't as simple as now communion on the hand is a thing and anyone can do it. It had to be seen as the, um, uh, what's the word? The, um, 
if if a contrary usage prevails that's that's the term so if there was a contrary usage like communion on the hand and there was majority of people doing it so i want to i want to just outline very quickly what happened in the united states to make communion on the hand the thing um the apparent norm so uh let me share my screen here okay so this is from new liturgical movement um so in 1975 and again 1976 archbishop joseph bernardin the president of the national conference of catholic bishops attempted in vain to garner two-thirds of the bishop's vote in favor of receiving communion in the hand the following year, which coincided with the end of Bernadine's term as president, bought, brought one final attempt. Bernadine appointed Archbishop Quinn, who became the, the successor, and during the proceedings, a brave bishop requested a survey of the bishops be taken to ask whether or not communion in the hand was widely practiced in his diocese. <laughs> For without the practice's current wide use, the first condition of the indult would not be satisfied. So it wasn't enough for the bishops to vote on it. It already had to become, you know, common practice. I have, uh, this is from Michael Davies' book. Uh, I don't know if that's coming up. Pope Paul's New Mass. And uh, he actually lays out uh, what this, uh, bra who this brave bishop was um this is so important because this is like oh my gosh how did this slip slip by well well this this is how it happened um so bishop blanchette of joliet illinois so uh he explained that permission permission could be requested if the contrary usage prevailed this is in memorali domini so this is like this is this is what is required um, he said, we're now going to discuss and probably vote on whether we want to petition the Holy See. And we have not established that a contrary usage prevails. I said a simple way to do that would be to ask the ordinaries to indicate whether in their dioceses the contrary usage prevails. The ordinary should know he is the shepherd of the diocese. Um, and so I asked that the agenda be amended so that the first step finding out whether the contrary usage prevails could be verified. And if it were verified, then we could get on with the rest of the agenda. But if the first step is not verified, how can we logically go on to the second step? That was my motion. So then this goes on, this article. Though his request was seconded and supported in writing by five other bishops, Bernadin had the motion dismissed as out of order. The bishops then voted only to once more fall short of the two-thirds majority. But Bernadine decided to unlawfully begin gathering absentee votes from any bishop he can find, including retired bishops who no longer administered any dioceses. And the number was adjusted to meet the two-thirds majority. So uh, when, I, when I first read that, I was uh, shocked to see that, firstly, Memorali Domini, uh, the indult requires that a contrary usage already prevails. And this was in a few um, countries and dioceses. And then they needed a two-thirds vote. And then that vote needed to be approved by the Holy See. But what ended up happening is just, um, it just, the bishops would request. So the bishops took, took charge. It, it wasn't about the people. It wasn't about the lay faithful. What, what do they want? It was about what the bishops thought the lay people wanted and then proceeded to um, ram it through. So that, that seems to be what happened uh, with the United States. Yes. Uh, once again, this is an abuse, according to Paul VI. And so this was in, it was an isolated abuse because people don't just spontaneously do an abuse altogether in a coordinated way. This was in Belgium, Netherlands, France, and Germany. And it spread, as, as I mentioned, because it was promoted by bishops. Hmm. And as you just mentioned, some of our own bishops promoted it. 
and this is lamentable because it's against the mind of the Holy See, but remember, the bishops were already openly revolting against Humanae Vitae. Hmm. So we're not surprised when they also revolted against the communion on the tongue. This, um, I would just want to give the, uh, I was trying to find that abuse. Okay, so the, the actual abuse, Paul VI, in a handwritten memorandum in which he proposed the outline for Memorale Domini, the which is where he's he's sending this to Bunini actually because this was the outline that Paul VI gave before Memorale Domini was written, and this is cited by Bunini himself on page six thirty seven in his Reform of the Liturgy, and he says this. Paul VI says it must be kept in mind that the practice or abuse of distributing communion in the hand is already widespread in some countries, and that the bishops, for example, Cardinal Suens and others, think it cannot be suppressed but it was in those four countries in particular, but it spread everywhere because there were powerful men who wanted it. And this is the history that we really, as we continue to uncover the history of what went wrong here, we need to, and lamentably, we have to hold certain shepherds accountable for what they have done to the sheep. And we need to do that with all charity so that we don't fall into sins ourselves, sins of hatred mm -hmm. or an unforgiving spirit towards men who may be led astray by the devil. But we need to take account of that and understand what happened, as you said. One, one important thing that's coming up uh, with, with the documentary, so we're doing a trilogy of films on the Latin Mass called Mass of the Ages. Uh, I saw someone in here, what did they say? Um, uh, when, how is this, <laughs> how is this documentary not out already? I feel your pain. Um, documentaries like this take a, a lot of time. We're putting a lot of love into it, which means a lot of production value. And, uh, the first film will premiere August 15th, Feast of the Assumption. And go to our website to get notified about that. Cause that's the only way you're going to be a part of the premiere and you can watch it live with us. August 15th. Anyways, um, uh, where in the world was I going with that? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, one thing that's come up in, in many interviews that I've done uh, about for this documentary is I'm asking the question, how can we be both faithful Catholics but criticize a church teaching? Um, and that word teaching... Uh, it's easy to equivocate and give that an uppercase T and say, well, obviously, if you're a Catholic, Catholic who rejects church teaching, you're not a really good Catholic. But there's, there's a whole level of teachings that aren't uh, doctrinal and dogmatic and that fall under the category of custom and, and practice and policy. I think as faithful Catholics, and I'd love your, your thoughts on this too, um, I think as faithful Catholics, we can criticize in charity, we can criticize customs that we think are wrong, even if they come from the church. And we can even classify them as disastrous for the faith. I think communion on the hand is a custom uh, that was allowed by Paul VI that has, that has led to a disastrous loss of faith in the Eucharist. It, was, it wasn't the only thing. Um, I, would, I just want to give a few examples in history of bad customs <laughs> because this is kind of, I think, open people's eyes to, oh, the church, ha church customs are not, you know, infallible. So, for example... In the early church, um, if you were a sculptor, a painter, a soldier, um, or if you were in theatrical performances, you could not be baptized. <laughs> you, well, you, you couldn't be a candidate for baptism, um, which is kind of funny. Uh, and uh, baptisms were done naked. Um, I can see why they changed that. Um, that's why you had, you know, quote, deaconesses for the women to baptize them. In the fourth Lateran Council of 1215, uh, one of the canons was that Jews and Muslims should be marked by special clothing. 
that's weird. Um, uh, I could see how that would lead to some harm and that would be later, you know, reversed or dropped. So we have all these customs that are, aren't infallible, perfect, and that can lead to, um, disaster. The most, l let me say one more, cause the, I think the most pointed one is, uh, is one that has to do with, uh, the church abuse crisis. So the canon law of 1917 was changed into the 1983 canon law. And uh, please bear with me, this, this is gonna connect to communion in the hand. But canon 1395, the current canon says that a cleric who in another way has committed an offense against the sixth commandment of the Decalogue um, with a minor below the age of 16 years is to be punished with just penal penalties. What's a just penalty? It's kind of ambiguous. We don't know. This, this decision to, to change canon law and to, I'll, I'll read the old one in just a sec, to rephrase it to say just penalties meant that any bishop could look at a situation and say, oh, he shouldn't have done that, but a just penalty will be, we'll just send him to you know, a psychiatrist or on a retreat or something, and don't do that ever again. That's a just penalty. The old canon law said they are to be suspended, declared infamous, and are deprived of any office, dignity, responsibility. And if, and then it goes on in, in more serious cases. So it was very specific, right? So now we have canon law itself, which we could say, we could criticize and say, that led to a disaster, a catastrophe in the church was this this ambiguous phrasing of canon law led to a disaster and actually pope francis is updating it so in december 8th of this year um it's a little more specific so punished with deprivation of office and with other just penalties so uh the you know pope francis himself saw that this was a problem so all all this to say these crazy church customs of the past canon law being ambiguous we as as faithful catholics can look at tradition look at the consistent teaching of the church and say actually i think this this um indole is a bad idea and i think the pew study can bear that out so what would you say to that timothy yeah I, the most important thing is to remember that obedience is the swiftest right to humility and that uh, we need to, when in doubt, obey. Uh, our, our instinct as Catholics should be to obey the hierarchy in all things. And That's this right. should be our attitude, our attitude of piety. Piety means to reverence those above you, the elders, the parents. And so we need to have this disposition. And that needs to be the, the foundation. So before we even talk about any sort of criticism or disobedience or whatever, we need to really have a disposition of humility because far too many people, especially people just get online and start complaining about the bishops or the Pope and they just start bad mouthing people and they just get angry. And I get it. People are wounded. We've had problems and, and abuses and all sorts of things. I get that, but we can't fall into then the sin of impiety and start to just uh, calumniate or, or bad mouth the bishops. We need to keep them, uh, keep that respect still, uh, key. So that's, I think, the foundation that we need to have so that we're always, you know, when we look at history, when we look at the saints, there are certain saints who even rebuke the Pope. For a great example is St. Catherine of Siena at a time when there was beginning to be three popes at a time, and she began to uh, rebuke the Pope of Avignon to go back to Rome, and later uh, St. Vincent Ferrer, so you have the saints and the way that they talk to a pope, that's the imitation of any sort of situation where, God forbid, we have a situation where there is a cleric or a bishop doing something that we know is wrong or respectfully we think is wrong. So that's the disposition we need to have. We need to imitate the saints. But we need to look at church history. We need to realize that there have been decisions of a prudential character not according to the infallible teachings of the, the faith. Like That's you're right. saying, these are disciplines. These are, we're going to make a distinction here. Now we still need to have that attitude of humility and piety to obey those disciplines in all things, except in certain rare cases. Now I think of, 
uh, if anybody wants the best defense of this is from the charitable anathema by Dietrich von Hildebrandt. And he has a, a essay in this, in this text called belief and obedience. And he makes reference to the fact that the Jesuits were suppressed by Clement the 14th in 1773. And this was at the time when the Jesuits were at the forefront of preaching the gospel and they, the Pope was pressured by secular monarchs to suppress them and he suppressed them. And this was reversed by two popes later. And this was reversed because men of God, both clerics and lay, were able to say, no, this is wrong. We know that you were pressured to do this. You made a bad decision in a moment of weakness. We forgive you because you're our father. We're not going to hate you, but we are going to urge you, exhort you with respect to reverse this decision. And so this is what we need to have. Now, there's two other examples I want to bring up. That is the breviary of Paul the Third and the breviary of Urban the Eighth. Your your examples are so much cooler than mine. <laughs> no, so these two, these were two officially promulgated liturgical changes, which were uh, were later reversed because men of God said, No, your holiness, with respect, with respect to you, your holiness please, we exhort you to reverse this decision because it is unwise for X, Y, Z. And so this is, this is an example of a respectful, very pious presentation to our Holy Father or our fathers of a respectful exhortation or, or pleading to reverse some decision. So there are, there are a multitude of examples of these things even even in layman there's a here's another great example i thought of the uh lateran five so 1517 in the spring of 1517 there's a layman at the ecumenical council who says to the pope he says if you don't change and reform this church god's wrath will come upon the church this is the spring of 1517 they don't reform the church so what happens in the fall of 1517 martin luther nails his theses Wow. And so this is then there's a total revolt and bloodshed ensues. And so there is a place for that. And we need to be once again, need to have that foundation of humility and piety. But there is a time when that's the case. And the final example is St. Thomas Aquinas, where he actually says that there is a time for this, which is where uh, he, he makes mention of St. Paul rebuking St. Peter his superior. And this is in the uh, secunda secundi under the uh, heading of charity. So if you look up charity, he talks about this as fraternal correction. So it's, it's deeply traditional to have this. We just need to keep in mind that piety and that humility. So I, maybe we could just summarize everything in just a neat package, uh, and then we can sign off here and uh, do this again soon. This was very fun. Um, I would say the the way I'd summarize it, the way that helps me think of it is a faithful Catholic can look at uh, the tradition of the church, can read the saints, read the councils, and can can understand that a certain practice has has uh, been lost or changed that is detrimental to the faith especially when uh, the, the recent popes and recent documents have um, underscored the same thing. So with communion in the hand, we can look at 2,000 years of history and say, okay, communion in the hand was done, looked very different, uh, but then 1,500 years of piety reinforced that communion on the tongue is just the better way to receive our Lord. It's more reverent. It's it's um, avoids risk of profanation. Uh, that's a lot a lot more liberal when it's received in the hand. Um, and the the church has uh, enumerated that again and again and again in recent times. Okay, yet communion in the hand is still the norm. To I mean that it's not really the norm, but it's it's the way it's done in most Novus Ordo parishes today. So a faithful Catholic should look at tradition and uh, in the 3,000 dioceses in the world, 
uh, you can come to the conclusion that communion on the tongue is the preferred way that the, the priest um, ought to give it to you. It is your right as a Catholic. And uh, if you don't have a priest who would allow you to give, get receive communion on the tongue, then find a, a parish that does, um, especially a Latin Mass parish, because that is the, the norm, and there's no indults uh, of that sort in the Latin Mass. Uh, so in summary, Timothy, how would you better summarize uh, everything we talked about? Yeah, this has been confirmed. Uh, it's the tradition of the Church, and it's been confirmed by the Holy See as objectively better and to be retained by both Pope St. Paul VI, St. John Paul II, Benedict XVI, confirmed by multiple official uh, congregations. And so this does not need to be uh, an issue that divides Catholics from one another. It's something that we can clearly see the mind of the church, and there's no reason for it to spread as it has. And we need to make every effort in our parishes and our families to limit or eliminate the communion on the hand, mm -hmm. according to the mind of the church, with God's help. It's all for Christ the King. That's what this is all about. I just want him to be loved and adored and honored in all the tabernacles of the world, even to the end of time. That's what I want. And yeah, just if just do it. Commute on the tongue. Like, let's bring it back. Let's bring it back. Uh, let's make it the the uh, practiced norm um, in most churches uh, in the country and in the world. Um, Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, Timothy, how would, how can people get in touch with you? Yeah, meaningofcatholic.com is our website. We have various resources for the faithful. It's designed to be the one-stop shop to give you all the resources that you need <clears throat> to get through the crisis, both on a spiritual level and dogmatic level to raise our families of the faith. And we also have a YouTube channel as well, meaningofcatholic.com. Uh, and... Look for the book, myself, is uh, City of God versus City of Man, which is going to go through a lot of the history, some of, the, some of which we've discussed here. And also, Kennedy Hall has Terror of Demons, Reclaiming Traditional Ma Class Catholic Masculinity, both of which will be printed by Tan Books later this year. So that is it. Awesome. Very good. Uh, we're doing a documentary on the Latin Mass. It comes out August 15th. Um, you can get notified at theliturgy.org and join us for a live premiere on August 15th, Feast of the Assumption. Uh, really excited about this. Uh, it's, it's simultaneously inspiring and beautiful and surprising. Uh, we're, we're following real traditional Catholic stories and we're putting the beautiful, glorious Latin Mass um, on full display. We're showing you how beautiful and important it is and how it's a foundation of faith in a time of crisis. Um, and we're doing three films. It's a trilogy. So uh, go to our website, get notified about that. Any donations that come through at this point is going to help us just reach more Catholics with, with our marketing. So we're, we're putting everything into it. Um, that's it. All right. Uh, let, let me know in the comments. Uh, what you'd like an episode on. Uh, again, these are just, I like to do these weekly if we can. And uh, I like to have a conversation with you guys in the chat. What's a, a topic about the Latin mass that you'd like to see covered? And we can, we can cover that. Subscribe, do all the things. All right, Timothy, that's it. Let's go uh, kiss our wives and have dinner. <laughs> God bless you. Jesus is king. Thank you.